my friends, and welcome to episode 123 of the Kiss Army Nation podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Pasquale Verri. And I am Todis Pera. Welcome to the show, everyone. On this episode, we're going to tell a story, a story of courage and perseverance, a story that needs to be told, a story that needs to be especially heard from our young people. It's a call to arms to take control of your life, to define your life based on purpose and happiness, rather than allowing the negative to define you. Using questions from my secondary five ethics class, we are going to tell a story or the story of our next guest, the author of Every Nine Minutes, Christina Vitagliano. Welcome to the show, my good friend. Hi, how are you? Good, Thank good. Thank you for having me. Doing good. Such a pleasure to have you, Christina. This is awesome. This is going to be awesome, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I remember meeting Christina uh, a few years ago. Christina, when I, when I went to the, uh, the Kiss Mini Golf in uh, oh, yeah. the old location in Las Vegas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you gave my friend and I the grand tour of the place, you know, <laughs> the, VIP, the VIP tour, <laughs> and uh, one of my bucket lists to get married at the Kiss Chapel. Yeah, that's so, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So I had the uh, had a, a, like a mock wedding with my friend, and I'm hoping to this day, that. yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, and geez. I rem- and I hope to this day I'm not okay. actually married. You know, <laughs> because I, I, I could be. <laughs> you're right, Mary. In Las Vegas, you're married. In Las in Vegas, Vegas, you're married. Exactly. Right. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, you know, Christina, we're, we're going to uh, begin uh, uh, your story, not from the beginning, but from the present. So uh, you are, as uh, Paz was saying, the true definition of a success story with the creation of the Monster Mini Golf. So uh, can you tell us uh, how that came about? Sure. Um, gosh, it was 2004. I had just finished writing my book. So that's how long ago I I actually finished writing that. Um, And then I needed to get it edited. And at that time, Patrick and I didn't have any money. We pretty much lived, you know, paycheck to paycheck if we made it to that. Um, So when I found out that not only do you have to have it professionally edited, but it would probably run me about $5,000 to get that done. And then I had to hopefully, you know, search for a publisher. So at the time, um, we needed the money that we were making. That's how we survived. So um, I owned an antique auction house at the time. And Patrick had a sound company, production company, um, that he rented his gear to concerts. And I thought, well, what if I can create something that will allow me to continue to try to get the book published, but also make some money on the side to raise the $5,000? And how can I do both of those at the same time? So I actually ended up selling my auction house mailing list because when you own an antique auction house, you don't actually own any inventory because you sell it every time you have an auction. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't really a lot there. So I sold my mailing list, but we had this big old warehouse. Um, Patrick stored his audio equipment in the area that we we rented, and I had my auction house in the other part of it. So um, we could still pay for the rent there. So I said, I have to create something that fits in here. So that's kind of how it started. And I said, you know, I looked up online, what are the top businesses that you can own, like mom and pop businesses that you can own that are profitable, that you can start with almost no money. And mini golf came up. So that's how this started was, okay, well, maybe I can have a mini golf company. But we lived in New England at the time. And it's very similar to living in Canada. We have snow. So I thought to myself, I can't make money three months out of the year because that's, you know, summertime. And when it rains, it's even worse. So I said, what if I built it indoors? And we were on a trip to New York City. I think maybe Patrick had a gig there. We were driving home. And I'm just sitting in the truck thinking and thinking, how do I get this all to work? So I turned to him and I said, I think I'm going to do mini golf indoors. And he went, what? (laughs) Why would anybody do that? (laughs) That's crazy. Um, So I said, you know, here's what I looked up. This This is where I've come to. And I think I can build my own course. And he said, how? I said, well, we had a friend that owned um." like a little uh, restaurant in town. It was a very small town. There's like 5,000 people in the town, old mill town in Northeast Connecticut. And um, and she was always looking for bartenders. Um, my background is in retail management and nightclub management. So it was, I, I and owning an antique auction house was, you know, I had had that for about five years. Um, so I said, I'm just going to stop everything that I'm doing and try to focus on this book. So um, I sold a mailing list. Um, my friend gave me a job being a bartender. Um, 
in a hippie bar, which was the worst place in the world for me because I don't, I just not my, it's not my world, but, but she was a great person. And, uh, and everything that I made each week, I would go out and buy materials to make a mini golf course because in my head, I was building a monster mini golf course. Mm-hmm. And monsters came to be because I thought to myself, well, one, I'm not a construction worker. I, you know, I don't know how to, you know, I'm not a great artist, I don't think, but I have a good imagination. And monsters are whatever you can imagine a monster to be. So if I made this big blobby thing with some eyes, that's a monster. So that's how the monster theme came. It was and the mill itself was very old, should have been condemned. Um, so over the next six months or so, I make money. I go to the craft store or find things outside or wherever I could possibly find them. And I started building a mini golf course. Um, wow. I painted it with black light fluorescents because I did learn from managing nightclubs. If you paint everything with black light or fluorescent paint, that's all the people are going to see and everything else, which is all the imperfections. They don't see it unless you turn the lights on and yeah. which you would never do. So that's kind of how, you know, the, the black light and the glow in the dark came to be. Everything was based on, um, it was kind of MacGyver. You know, I've got this amount of money. This is what I can do. I know this works and this is how it's going to go. <laughs> so, um, you know, the goal was to open monster mini golf and hopefully raise the $5,000 I needed to get my book published. And that was in 2004, well, 2003, we opened the first Monster Mini Golf in May of 2004. Actually, on May 27th, which is a pretty uh, interesting kiss date. But yeah, yeah. Wow. And then I guess uh, this uh, then led to the creation of uh, of Kiss by uh, Monster Mini Golf. Yeah. Uh, is that is that correct? Yeah, pretty much. We um, once we opened um, again. My my background's in marketing and, and management, so I, you know I got sucked in. I'm a workaholic, so I got sucked in. I got focused on Monster Mini Golf and. Um, I didn't want anybody to steal the idea. It, it, it was very popular, very quick. So I learned how to franchise the business. Mm-hmm. And then we started franchising it all over the country. And as you grow, um, your brand and, and the strength of your brand is very important to you. So I was always looking to kind of take that next step without having it take years and years to get there. So we used to go to Las Vegas a lot um, for trade shows and things. And you know, the more you see Las Vegas, if you're a business owner, that's a goal to have one of your yeah, locations yeah, in Las you Vegas. Want to be there. Yeah. yeah. But if you're going to be there, you got to bring it. Yeah. You know, I couldn't just be a regular monster mini golf. It has to be the adult version, the fun version. So the last hole on our golf course is this big clown. His name glows Glozo. And you actually golf up into up his tongue and into his head. And that's the last hole on, on all monster mini golf golf courses. Um, and my husband, Patrick, uh, is a Kiss fan. Although now that we know what Kiss is, he's probably less of a Kiss fan than what we realized. But <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a whole different world. But he was a Kiss fan. So all of our friends would say, hey, why didn't you build Gene Simmons' head on that last hole? And we would laugh and say, because he would sue us. Um, so as we got bigger and Las Vegas and the vision of Las Vegas came to be, then the dream of and the joking of hey let's build a kiss monster mini golf course started to become a reality and i started asking all my business friends whenever i was in a meeting um when i got done they say you know i have any questions yeah you have gene simmons phone number and, and that was my regular my last question to everything for about a year and then one day um somebody said you know what i actually know the guy that owns the kiss coffee house and Patrick and I lived in Rhode Island at the time. We had moved to Rhode Island, which is very close to where we were before. And he said, he actually lives in Rhode Island. So the guy that built the Kiss Coffee House is from Rhode Island. Oh. Um, and so were we. So they introduced us, Brian Galvin, who's a wonderful guy, by the way. Um, I met with him and he said, your first call is to Kiss's attorney because you need a Kiss license. You're not going to beat the band for a while. <laughs> So that's how it started. I started talking to Bill Randolph. Um, and about a year later, we had a KISS license, a KISS contract. And, and that's how that started. Oh, it um, took you a year. Okay. Yeah, almost a year. Probably about nine, 10 months to get our wow. contract together. Everything went back. Our attorneys, their attorneys. It, it was a bit, that's a big project, you know, to own a KISS venue. Um, then once we were had our contract signed, we handed over the check. Um, then we met Paul and Jean. So we didn't meet them until everything was signed on the dotted line. <laughs> Finalized. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. What a process. <laughs> yeah, it was it was interesting. Yep. And was there a collaboration between you and the band to get uh, the Kiss Mini Golf going? In oh, yeah, yeah. Concept and themes? 
So once we had all of our paperwork done, it was legal. And that pretty much means, okay, well, these people are legit. They can actually build one of these. Uh, they've been through the attorneys and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the next phone call I got was from Del Ferrano, who used to be um, Epic Rights at, at the time, Live Nation. He was um, in signatures before that. Very, very, a um, lot of experience. Mm -hmm. um, he said, okay, now it's time for you to meet Paul and Jean. And we were like, okay. <laughs> And Patrick and I were terrified. <laughs> we're like, oh, no. How does that work? They said, well, you fly out here at Beverly Hills and you're going to come to our office and you're going to present them with your sketches for this golf course and your whole venue. And we said, okay, we can do that. And that's, I mean, that's where all, all artists based. We're all very creative. We've been doing it for a while. At that time, we've been doing it for a while. So uh, we said, okay, that's no problem. And Dell said, just know that when you do this, you're going to create one sketchbook for Paul and one sketchbook for Gene. I'm like, all right, well, sure. They want one of their own. That's that's fine. He said, you make the Paul one geared towards Paul and you make the Gene one geared towards Gene. <laughs> that was the beginning of this is just... getting to know Kiss. And I was like, uh, okay. yeah. it seems so odd to us at the, <laughs> at the time. So um, we did that. And then we got to Beverly Hills. We got to, um, to the office. We sat down and we sat down. I think like we were sitting there by ourselves for like 20 minutes, terrified, absolutely terrified. And, uh, and then Dell came in and he said, hang on. And he came back. He said, let me go get Paul. And he came back with Paul, but not Gene. No. So um, Paul sits down and he goes through the sketchbook and he explains, um, you know, he gives us his opinion on things. Very well spoken. Very, very nice. Um, he actually changed our name from uh, Monster Mini Golf Presents Kiss to Kiss by Monster Mini Golf because mm -hmm. Kiss was a much bigger name than Monster Mini Golf. And he was very clear about pointing that out. Um and he was right. He was 100% right. And then uh, when we got done, Pat and I are just sitting there waiting. You know, we got to meet Gene. Is he just not, not going to meet Gene today? And Dell came back and Paul shook our hands very nice. And he went on his way. And then Dell said, uh, Gene's not coming here. And I was, I was, I was kind of mad. I was like, come on, we could, we threw 3,000 miles. We're not going to meet Gene. And he said, no, you're going to go to his house. Oh, really like, wow. oh, okay. So now we're talking. <laughs> family jewels, right? So now I'm scared. I'm not mad anymore. I'm like, holy cow, now I'm even more scared. And Pat and Pat was like tapping me under the table. Oh my God, we're going to see Gene. <laughs> so um and Dell came back. He said, Let me go get somebody to drive you. I was like, Well, that's weird. Dell's not going. So he came back. He said, um, let me get talent to drive you. That's what he said. And I said, Talent. Like they have a driver that like, you know, that's his job. His talent is to drive people around. So this kid comes in, he's probably in his mid to late twenties, total like rock and roll kind of kid. He's wearing literally every accessory you could ever imagine. Like, you know, rings on every finger and just a nice kid, but he looks like he's a rock and roller, you know? And uh, we, and we, he, I said, you're going to drive us. And, and Pat said, are, are, have you been to Gene's house before? And that kid said, the kid goes, no, never. I'm terrified of that guy. So now <laughs> We're driving in a car that was like, I don't know, it, it's the equivalent of like a Pinto from the 70s, right? Uh -huh. That was his car, right? Poor, he was so nice. And we're in his car and we get to Gene's house and that giant gate opens, right? We drive up the driveway and we're like, okay. And even Talent's like, you guys ready? I said, guess so. <laughs> and we get out of the car and we look up and there's Gene at the top of his stairs outside his house, which we've all seen top of those stairs, you know, yeah. Beverly Hills. And he's staying there with his glasses on, a suit. Big Gene, you know, just looking very serious. And Dell's with him. So Dell made it there before us, which was very smart of him. Uh, and uh, we're like, okay, this is this is scary. So we had to walk all the way up those stairs. And he's just standing there looking at us. He's super intimidating. And we get up there and, you know, he introduces himself. And we just presented, you know, our sketches to him. Hmm. But he's different. I mean, they're, they're very, very different personalities, which we all, I think everybody knows that even the fans know that. And I, they're both super cool, but very different. So Gene, you know, he, we're standing up for this whole meeting. It's on the, one of his um, glass top displays in his, in the office where all his kiss stuff was. Um, and we're flipping the pages and he would open it up and he'd see a picture or a sketch of himself in a prop. And he'd say, good. And he turned the page and it would be one of the other band members he looked at it and just turned the page and then he find himself <laughs> again <laughs> good <laughs> so um that was kind of like the, the gene story of that but then he opened it up to like the center i think the center part was a double page spread of the entire golf course like bird's eye view mm. of the whole thing or the whole venue and he looked at it for a second and he said how big is this course how many square feet 
I said, well, we do about, I think it's about 14,000 square feet, the whole venue. And then he said, which to me, all of us, he said, that's almost as big as a house. And I said, 14,000 square feet, almost as big as a house. And to me, like, and and in, it was just instinctively, uh, I didn't think, and I wasn't nervous anymore. I'm like, your house, maybe. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, not mine. <laughs> square feet, right? It's like, no way. And he looked at me and he went, nothing's as big as my house. And I said, <laughs> so I just met Gene Simmons. That, that's <laughs> just, it. Okay, know, this is it. <laughs> yeah, pleased to meet you. That's right. This is it. Pleased to meet you. Yeah, uh, uh, the rest is, is history. <laughs> that is so Gene Simmons. It was, that was it. I remember saying to myself, that's the guy I've listened to. I listened to all his books on tape. And I had always been, I'm a fan of Gene, obviously. I, I get along with him really well. But from the time I listened to his books, and this is because Patrick made me at the time, I was like, oh, kiss. But then I got kind of into it. I'm like, this guy's not just a guy playing in a band. He's a lot right. more than that. Yeah. Um, and then as we listen to more and more, I'm like, I would get along with him. I really would. And we do. We get along great. So we just click business wise. Nice. Well, yeah. Gene's not very easy to impress. And you really impressed him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you started working with Gene uh, with uh, his events, the, uh, the uh, selling his guitars. Yeah. And and, and yeah. now and now his auctions. Yep. So the, yeah. specifically with the with the auctions, um, I don't know, you know, you know, we're getting towards the end of the road now, and I'm seeing that fans are starting to sell off their collection. It, yeah, it, I saw that know, too. It, yeah. Is that what Gene is doing now? Because it is the end of the road and he wants to move forward because he's he, you guys are creating events where he's giving away his collection yeah. to the fans, and now he's doing the auction. What, what's so, what's the the thinking behind that? This is um, I, I will say over the last few years, Gene's changed a lot. And I think it's, I think age does that. We all, I mean, you hit your, you, know, you hit 50 and you change a little bit, but then as you get into your mid fifties, you start, yeah. I think, or COVID, if anything, made us all realize that this is very finite. Yeah. You know, anything yeah. can happen at any time. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, and I think everybody reevaluated to some degree their life. So. And the um, values, right? The values yeah, of things. And their values. Right? Yeah. Everything, you know, it just, yeah. it, just the way it works yeah um but at the same time right around when all of that was happening his house went up for sale hmm. so when his house went up for sale he, he they had to take everything out of there so his office which for years and years has just been you know his world had to get moved so everything got packed up and got put into a warehouse so now it's all being stored in the warehouse i can't even imagine how many thousands of dollars that had to cost in la somewhere so the first step um, from Gene was we got a call from him saying, hey, I think I want to set up my office as a KISS museum because I've been looking at this for almost 50 years and people who come to my meetings can see it or visit me, but my fans never get to see it and they always ask to see it. Why am I going to keep looking at it? It's about time I share it with them. Mm -hmm. So that's how that started. So um, that went from, okay, well, that's a cool idea to it seemed like four minutes later, six trailer trucks were in Las Vegas and we were building <laughs> his office in our venue. Yeah, right. That's kind of how it works with Gene sometimes. <laughs> so that's how the transition went from his office in Beverly Hills to the Kiss Museum in Las Vegas. But when they moved all of that, it wasn't just his office. It was his basement, his garage, his warehouses. His mom had passed all around the same time. So her entire house was in storage. Um, and all kinds of, all this KISS stuff that was, you know, on display and not on display. So when we started setting up the museum, he said, look, just put one of everything out. You don't need seven, because he has a lot of everything. He's, he's a bit of a hoarder, just a little bit of a hoarder. <laughs> so so that, that made it easier to set up and, and display more items. But that also meant that we have a warehouse full of stuff. Mm -hmm. So... I said, what are you going to do with all this? He said, I don't know. We'll figure out how to sell it. I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. And then that was just the KISS items that we have duplicates of because pretty much he has one of everything that KISS has ever made, plus all the gifts from fans, plus awards. I mean, you guys oh know everything, God. right? Oh, yeah. That's all on display. But then there's probably duplicates of almost everything. Wow. And he, then he has all the paperwork and all, I mean, you've seen some of it on, on the auctions and, yeah. and yeah. he, this man kept everything, his report cards from first grade, his second grade, every, everything, like literally everything. Um, so as we're boxing it all back up and storing it, 
and he's starting to think, you know what? He said, my fans are going to treasure this more than anybody else. My family is going to have, has a lot of his own things. He's got tons of stuff still. Um, but what's it, what good is it sitting in boxes in storage? And then what happens? The only time it's ever going to be sold is when I'm dead. He goes, I want to do it now. I want my, I want to see my fans. I want to hand my fans, my items. And that's how it started. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was, that was his decision. Um, and then the other stuff, and there's just really a lot of it. We have a big warehouse. This is going to take years and years to go through all of these items. Um, so some of it goes into auctions and then uh, the event coming up at the electric lady, some yeah. you know, get some of that. So yeah, it's, and still years and years of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the electric lady uh, event happening in New York. So that's this start. That was part of, Hey, I want to continue to give my items to fans, but let's, we did this event in Vegas. It was fun. It was great. We have tons of room in Vegas. He said, I want to do something in New York city and I want to do it from the studio. I started it, which is yeah. amazing. Oh my God. Yeah. And there's only, I think, I think electric lady, um, Abbey road studios and probably one other one in the UK, I think in the world is less than six studios that exist and are still running that were up in the seventies. Mm -hmm. Electric Lady is one of them. So uh, he talked to the owner of the Electric Lady. He was thrilled and he scheduled three days after the last show. And he said, let's do my event then. And I'll spend the day um, with, you know, however many people we can fit in there. We'll sell that many tickets and we'll record a, a kiss song together. So they're going to actually record a kiss song with Gene Simmons, whether they can sing or it doesn't even matter. He's, he's a natural teacher. Um, and they have fun. And then at the end of it, he'll hand them um, a case full of his stuff. That's wow. fantastic. Yeah, it's it's just, I mean, he, he, I will say that I mean, I've worked with a lot of people in my lifetime. Um, and that everybody knows in Kiss, there's nobody like Gene. There's a, they, I think that's good. They broke the mold with him, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's, you know, he's a one off. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, you know, for uh for a Kiss fan, that that's a, that's a real dream, you know, to have that that kind of event. Yeah. And, you know, being with him, uh, that you know, Electric Lady, and getting his stuff and recording with him, it's uh, that's actually unbelievable, unbelievable. Even the guests, the people who you know they're coming as a guest, and usually this, yeah. you know, the, the plus ones, you know, usually they yeah. say, okay, I'll sit there, and and Gene takes his time. It's a full day, yeah. and you don't expect to have a good time. But every time we do something like this, everybody leaves and said, I had a blast because he, yeah. he's just entertaining. He's very good at yeah. making sure everybody is involved yeah. in what he's doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah, yeah. He's always been great with fans, but I think you're right. So when you said that he changed a lot lately, I can see more and more you know his uh, human side you know not mm -hmm. only to fans but to to people in general you know so it yeah. doesn't matter you don't have to be a kiss fan but uh, he he has so much uh report with people you know it's amazing yeah. it's yeah. amazing yeah, really. you know christina um we would like uh, our listeners to know that uh, you gave an amazing interview on the rock experience with uh, mike brown so if people want to learn more about your history so we highly recommend you check out that episode as we mentioned in the in the intro on this episode, we wanted to focus on you and your book every nine minutes, a very powerful memoir, let me say. So can you give us a little insight into your story? Wow. OK, um, <laughs> I'll try to do it in one sentence. Yeah, the book, um, the book takes place over the span of about 30 years. So when I was from four years old to I'm about 30 years old. And it covers um, uh, my life story, growing up with child abuse in the home, and um, and how you, not only you deal with it, but how it changes you and how it makes you the person that you are, whether you want it to or not. But how to balance it, hmm. you know, not let it own you. Um, and it's it's hard because it was important to me to cover that time span because when you're four and five years old and that's happening to you. That's one way you deal with it. You're you're very young. You have no idea what's going on. And all you want to do is please your parents. Then you get to be, you know, you're 11, 12 years old and you're starting to grow up. And that's a different person that has to deal with that same sexual abuse. And then you're in your teens. Hmm. For me, I, I mean, it really happened all, all until I left my house. Um, and that's an entirely different. You're almost an adult. So it was important to share how I still carried on or you know you try to carry on a normal life outside but inside 
how all of that is, you know, is going on and, and how you deal with it. And you know, by 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 taking a look at what you're doing, you know, your your uh, your present. So you know, you 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 might think you're in a good place. You know, you're living every kid's fan's dream. But why now? Why write this book now? Well, um, I think I shared with you earlier. I wrote it about twenty years ago. Years ago, and yeah. sat on it, and then said I didn't do anything with it. So it's the same thing. You know, why now is is a, is a good question. Um, in my head, I was going to raise the five thousand dollars and try to go get a publisher, and I didn't. I got so I got kind of like sucked into monster mini golf, and I let work kind of own me again um, by choice because I think I was more afraid to publish it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you write it and you get it all on paper, and then you're like, oh. That means yeah. that everybody, it's it's out there. Yeah. And I think it was a little bit chicken. And then as I get older, you get a little braver. And I, you know, two or three times I said, I'm going to try it again. And I didn't. And then COVID hit. Okay. And we're all sitting still. And I, I, in my 50s now, I'm, you know. That's it. At the point where this, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And that's right. when I did it. Yeah. yeah. Right. How difficult was it for you to write this book? Um, Writing it was actually helpful and i think uh, you know it's i think if you can get it down on paper um because not only was it therapeutic but it taught me a lot about myself because i'm writing my you know my life history and i'm writing it and i'm thinking to myself i just completed that sentence and i'm reading it and i'm like i know what's wrong with me what an idiot you know <laughs> but yeah. you have to see it sometimes on paper or get it out of you to actually see yourself doing some really stupid stuff you know and it it was very therapeutic. What I love about your story is that, you know, it's very therapeutic to basically put your story on paper and then just let it sit there. But yeah. you 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 chose yeah. to, to to share your story. Oh, and what's sure. really important is that, especially our young people, like I said mm -hmm. earlier, need to hear this story and hopefully learn from it and be inspired from this story. So after, you know, after I heard your interview with Mike Brun, I was so inspired that I, I went out and uh, and bought your book. And I messaged you afterwards, like, you know, do you want to come on? I'd love to talk to you about your book. But school was starting up again. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I talked to my ethics students about your story and your book? So I decided to talk a little bit about your book, a little bit about you, showed a little video in class. And as their first ethics assignment, I asked them to write you a question specifically about you or your book. So for the next part of this, of this episode, we have a few questions for you awesome. directly from our students. I First of all, thank you. Um, I think, you know, the more we can get this subject, unfortunately, in the in front of um, high schoolers, it's important. Education. Yes. I, I, and yes, I understand that it's a touchy subject. It's a difficult subject. But we live in the real world and kids mm -hmm. need to understand what's happening in the real world and be prepared for it. And yeah. sometimes that's not easy. No. Yeah. Nope. Okay. So I have some questions for you from my students. Uh, question number one. If you can go back in time, is there anything in your life you would change? Yeah, I'd speak up. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I was a very quiet kid. <clears throat> yeah. I'm outspoken now. <laughs> I was not. I was not. But I didn't know. You know, you don't know any better. You know, there's only so much, you know, as you're growing up We and we all, we're all probably around the same age. So mm -hmm. I would speak up. Um, that's just that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Second question. Because of your past life events, do you ever feel that nothing you do is ever good enough? How can someone overcome that? Yeah, that's a crutch. Um, and I think a, a lot of people who are, um, who have, been through child abuse we we had, all of us have the same you know check marks i think um and how we deal with them is is how it varies um you do because you just think there's always something wrong with you, mm -hmm. you know? um but um i think with me i just to me it was so important to not let anybody know what was going on inside the house so it's the opposite of speaking up i was terrified yeah but to be normal to, to be perceived as normal was very important to me, but also to be able to grow up and be smart enough and strong enough to not end up like the people in my house. So those people, as weird as that is, were kind of like 
that was my, don't be like them. And that was where I got my strength from. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to end up another person in this cycle of craziness. Mm -hmm. And it's just very determining. I, I, I was, I'm, I'm a very focused person anyway, but, mm -hmm. but that was it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Do you believe your worldview presently would be different if you didn't become such a success story? Um, that's a hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. I, I would say maybe, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't know. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm who I am today, but I will say that, um, I didn't, my goal wasn't to be successful and, and, and wealthy. And, you know, I mean, I, financially I'm, I'm, we're very good, which is, that was unimaginable to me when I, when you're eating, you know, from week to week, to me, it was just more important to be the best at whatever I was doing. I didn't care. So when I was in retail management um, or retail sales, I just wanted to be the best salesperson. And not because I wanted to beat everybody, because I just wanted to be the best person that I could be so that whatever I did next, I could do that too. It it was just about being a better person to me. Mm -hmm. Not yeah. not how much money you have, but yeah, yeah. You know. to, to, to feel good, right? Just for yeah, you, to right? feel good just about self esteem, who you, are. you know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Self-esteem and pride because it, yeah. it didn't exist on the other end of my life. So I exactly. made it yeah. one end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I didn't let it take over, which is, which is hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, next question. Um, do you feel angry about your past? Are you still working on your anger? And how can anybody ever let go of such anger? <laughs> I'll answer this one honestly. Yes to all of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really honest with you. Yes, yes, and but but um angry, of course. How can you not be angry at something like that? Yeah. You know, I, I I'm not the kind of person that can just say, okay, it happened yesterday, it doesn't happen, it's it's okay today. That that has impact, especially mm -hmm. on a child. Um, but it's not that I'm angry at me or angry at that. I'm more angry at the family that still exists today that supports it that won't admit it that lets it go on generation after generation so yes that makes me angry but does that make me an angry person with a chip on my shoulder and i and i'm taking it out on other people no no i've learned to that part of my life is not part of my life anymore because if it was it'd be very toxic and that's a hard decision it, it was a very very hard decision because we're all conditioned that family is everything. And it's really hard, no matter who you are, to understand that everybody's family isn't the same. Mm -hmm. Especially with social media today. Because mm -hmm. you yeah. Mother's Day and Father's Day. And and so, I, every time I see that, I feel for the kids who don't have the happy Mother's Day and happy. And, and yeah. it just doesn't exist in their lives. So... I often talk to my students about critical thinking and it's really difficult to unlearn what you've learned yeah. and what you've learned through a trauma is even that much more difficult to Definitely. unlearn. Yeah, of course. Yeah, totally. it absolutely is. Yeah. And it, it takes a lot of awareness of yourself and you don't have that much awareness of yourself when you're in your teens yeah. because you're always learning so much, but it's there, you know, it's there. And that's why to me, it's so important to talk about this and to get it out there and to share it because there's somebody sitting there who has no idea that other people, regular people, you know, have gone through it and they had some hard, you know, nothing was easy. You know, it's not because everybody sees me successful now. Nobody sees everything that it took to get there, you know? Um, so it's important, I think, for those of us who, you know, didn't end up in the gutter to share that it's possible. Okay, next question. Um, during your childhood, did anyone ever stand up for you or were you alone in this fight? 100% alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Up until, um, yeah, up until the end of the book. So I was in my wow. 30s. Patrick is the first person who knew. Hmm. Yeah, all through my life. Yeah. Makes and it again, that much more difficult to overcome something like that by yourself. Where do you draw that? Where's your foundation? for getting yourself out of that? Where do you learn that? Um, just, I don't know. So I think some of it, you, you're just born with some of it. Cause I, you know, some of yeah. it isn't taught. It was just there. I just 
from when I was a little kid, the only thing I wanted to do was be an adult so I could be on my own. Mm-hmm. That was it. And from the time I was small, I got to get out. And, it, and it's more than drive. It's about fire, you know, inside. Yeah. Something that you have inside there that uh, nobody's going to take out from you. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, getting back to the childhood uh, um, on question number six, uh, during those events, uh, you must have wanted to give up. So what what motivated you to push forward, not to give uh, up? I just didn't want him to win. Mm. If I gave up, he would have been thrilled. He won, right. Would have been thrilled. Yep. Or if I became a weak um, a weak person, like my mom, she would have been happy because everybody's life could just stay the way it was. And I didn't want that to happen. I also didn't want it to keep going, but I didn't know how to fix it at the time. I was just, you're young, you know, you're trying to deal with all of it. But, and I, I, I have the, and I think a lot of us do, when that's happening, that's not me. I was a different guy, get up, leave for school, different person. You know, you, you learn to disassociate clearly anything that's bad that's happening you know which even to this day i can do and it isn't always good (laughs) you know it's you know it's hard and do you believe that it's possible to forgive parents for the abuse they caused even though they may be a victim of uh, of the cycle of abuse maybe that's all they know that's their life so uh, do you think uh, forgiveness is uh, as it plays um I don't think that's all they know is a, is any reason to forgive anybody because everybody has the ability to stop and learn. So that's bullshit as far as I'm concerned. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but um, but I think everybody inside is not only different, but their situations are different. So can you forgive the person that did blank to you? Maybe you can. I don't know that. But I like you can't. That's not a blanket answer to like I, you can say everybody yeah. should give them i do think that you should over not overcome it balance it because nobody can overcome it either but learn to balance it so it doesn't own you Hmm. i think it's more important that it doesn't own you than can you forgive or forget or you know because one person might be able to forgive and move on because they have to have that structure in their lives and another person is okay without it so yeah and then, you know, forgiveness is such, such a big word. You know, there are so mm. many levels of uh, forgiveness. Yeah, you know? the first, so, I mean, for hands, you know, if somebody breaks your coffee cup, maybe yeah. you can probably, you can forgive That's them. Right. You know? yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, um, I don't think that's a blank. You can answer that for everybody. I think everybody's different. Good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, question eight. Um how is it even possible to value any of your memories and feelings from this time in a healthy way? You know, it's funny. We, I was just talking about this um, and not because of the abuse, because I mean, our families were all kind of, a lot of us have messed up families growing up um, mm. that even through all of the craziness that was happening, there was still structure in the family. Everybody still had manners. We got in trouble when we did something wrong you know it, you open the door for an adult you re- you didn't swear in front of an adult so it's weird that hmm. yeah i learned a lot of things that everybody learns it's just that it's it, you know the only way i compare it is everybody's watching tv and everything's going great and then somebody turns it to the horror channel <laughs> and then i live that for a little bit then it gets back to the brady bunch okay that's <laughs> an that. analogy so yeah, that's yeah. kind of how it is yeah, you know yeah, yeah. Um, wow. especially since my dad didn't want anybody to know what he was doing so mm-hmm. when he wasn't in the horror show with me then it was Brady Bunch outside um mm-hmm. and I think when you're a kid even if it's fake and it's not real or there's horror behind that bedroom door if in the morning you get up and people are happy and you're having breakfast and your brothers are laughing and there's a tv on that's like my god it's like Christmas you know yeah. I would much rather have that and I'd want to do anything to keep that happening yeah you know yeah. so hmm. it's weird it is yeah <laughs> um uh, question nine um what is the best approach to help someone who has been through a similar situation to yours um you mean how would you approach them or what is the best approach to help someone who has been through the same kind of stuff you know listen hmm don't judge. Yeah. Don't say, you know what you should have done? 
Um, yeah. Or, you know, just for the beginning, just listen. Um, because there, I will tell you that when I first published the book, um, it's a big thing to say, okay, well, I've written it now I've got it published because you get kind of wrapped up in the process. And then the next day it's out to the world, which means literally anybody can read it. And that's a little scary. And I was afraid of what people would think. And that's a big one. Everybody is afraid of what somebody's going to think of you and people oh. do treat you differently. You're not going to be able to avoid that, but you can't avoid those people, yeah. you know, because the real ones won't, they like you for, you know, who you exactly. actually are. Exactly. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's it takes time. But if you can find somebody that you can that will listen to you, um, that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be there, right? It's hard to so, keep it in. Yeah, mm -hmm. just be there, listen. You know. Yeah. Some sometimes you don't even need them to to say anything. Just be there. No. And, listen. and if yeah. you're a guy, you don't always need to save them. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. always like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The solution guy. Yeah, that's right. No, yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, need. Yeah. yeah, you're not looking for a solution because no, sometimes no, no. the solution's long gone. You're just exactly. looking to move on and be exactly. safe. Exactly. And I think making somebody feel safe is probably the number one priority. Mm -hmm. Safety. Yeah. Christina, you mentioned earlier that people only know you for the successful person that you are, and they don't know that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But now that they know that other stuff, do you feel that you were judged or treated differently since the book was released? No, I don't. No, Good. I think um, most people, um, you know, and who knows? I mean, to my face, everybody's been fine. <laughs> <Everyone> <laughs> knows, you know? yeah. Um. But, you know, I don't even care, really. There's, um, <laughs> it's weird. There was one time we were at a business dinner and it was an important business dinner. It was my husband and myself and there was a guy and, and another another woman with us. They weren't, they weren't a couple, it was an actual business dinner. <clears throat> and he brought the book up, which was odd because it had nothing to do with the business. And he said to my husband, how do you deal with that? And it was almost, it was very disrespectful and like, ooh, she's broken. And well, since then, I've kind of written the guy up, but but I was like, wow, it was just a horrible thing to say. It was weird to say. I, I definitely got judged. He looks at me differently. Um, yes, there's going to be people like that. So you can't avoid them. You will come in contact with them, just like, you know, there's toxic people in my family. But I've learned that you don't need to be around toxic people. Yeah. There's billions of people in this world. You know, Find the ones that like you. And I also don't have any problem being by myself. So I, I don't mind hanging out by myself. And that's a hard, that took a long time for me to realize that it's okay to live by yourself. It's okay to take care of just yourself. Um, that's a big one. You got to overcome that. And it's hard. You know, and it, it goes back to, this is why I think people should be speaking about this. Huh. We'll talk about everything in the world. Um, today's generation will bring up everything they want to fix everything they want to speak up about everything except this yeah it's still taboo and you know it's called every nine minutes because every nine minutes in the usa a case of child abuse is reported and reported is the big word there because i didn't report mine and i'll bet you uh, 80 plus percent of us never tell the authorities mm -hmm. so how crazy is that that those statistics are what they are um, yet nobody wants to talk about it. And there's kids sitting in school. I, you know, if it wasn't for school, and I will say this, um, Pasquale, which uh, I value my teachers from school at such a high level. You wouldn't, it's just amazing because they were my adults. They were the people I looked up to. Um, I went to school to see them every day because some of them made me feel like an actual human being. Of course. And that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Christina, one more question. Sorry, you know, Claudio. Um, your book started in 1968. So now we're in 2023. Have we made progress and getting the story? In? No. <laughs> really? Yeah? I, yes, you know, yes and no. I would say not enough. Um, mm. yes, we've made some progress. A lot of celebrities have have spoken up about this and made it a little bit better. Um, and I don't ever whoever speaks up about it, that's great. Um, there's also the other side, the people who play the victim. And mm -hmm. that's a hard one because if you're going to take the card and, and wear it you know, on your face and play it every second you get, that hurts those of us who are trying to better ourselves and yes. not be the victim. That's not cool. Um, but there are a lot of celebrities that speak about it. And I think that's wonderful. But if I was sitting at home and some celebrity is on TV talking about how, you know, this happened to her life, 
I hear the story, I feel for the story, but that to me isn't a human being, even though they are, I don't want to knock them, but, but they're so above and beyond who we are that I think that people like me and regular people have to speak about it because they can relate to us better. You know, they, I, I'm not living a celebrity life. I mean, I pay my bills, but we're not, you know, I'm not Gene Simmons, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? We're, we're just regular people and it's important. I think for us to talk about it. So when a memoir comes out from somebody that you can relate to, I think it's important, you know, mm -hmm. and self-publishing has done wonders for that. So I will say that that, that definitely has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to the last question, um, uh, question 10. At, at what point in your life did you become aware your emotional struggles were related to your past uh, traumas? And how can you even figure something like that out? Um, probably as I got to my late 20s, uh, when I got divorced. Mm -hmm. The decision I made to get divorced was my first, hey, I have to break this cycle because now I'm hurting other people. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I realized, oh, damn, this isn't just me that's suffering from this. I'm kind of sticking it on somebody else. And that's mm -hmm. not fair. Mm -hmm. And It was a real, like just a rude awakening of, I have to do something with my life and, and fix all of this. It was a long road, you know, and that's, I didn't, I've never done any drugs. Never. I didn't really drink when I was younger. Um, I was a very straight kid. I was always afraid that if I wasn't in control, that, he'd have more control of me. So that was a, a weird vice, but okay. yeah. That's an interesting point. You went through all that, but you never, it never led to drugs or alcohol. None, none, never had a cigarette, nothing. My fear was stay as alert and focused as I, as I could possibly be so that whatever was happening to me didn't get worse. I could mm -hmm. control, I, I got to the point where I know exactly what's going to happen. I know how to get through this. Um, you know, as I get to be a teenager, all my friends are partying and having a blast. And I would go out with all of them, but I never, never did Got anything. Into this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I was terrified of if I came home and didn't, I just was terrified. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. You know, what would you tell that teenager who does use uh, drugs and alcohol to cope? Yeah, that's, you know, and I don't know if that is something that's your is it does it come are you born with it is there you know so i i think i don't think i have the right to answer no you shouldn't or not, not nobody should do drugs but you know what i mean no don't do that because you're doing something wrong i don't know um mm -hmm. i just chose the path of there is no way this guy is going to do any more to me than he's already doing and i can't do it i can't let that happen you know um i i've always i've just been that person i don't but i don't have the answer to that no, well, well put. We were just talking today in class about the definition of ethics. And basically, you know, there's a we know the difference between right and wrong, but how do we know that? It's because of all of the influences in our lives. Yeah. So when we see a kid act up, we don't say, hey, you're a stupid kid. You're a troublemaker. You're there. No, because there's a story behind that kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we don't know what happened in the morning, what, what happened after school, what happened during lunch, what's happening yeah. in their lives. And here we are. And here we are judging these kids. We know nothing about them. Yeah, I think we live in a world where, especially social media, my gosh, I don't even know how you can be a kid these days with social media, mm -hmm, but yeah. um, we don't talk anymore, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And parents don't talk to kids, it seems, you know? So um, it, they live in their own little bubbles now because that they've been conditioned to live that way. And I don't even know how some of them are doing it. And yet, you know, when, we, when COVID hit, and I think maybe that's why I, I got so determined was the scariest thing to me was, oh, my God, if I was in high school and COVID hit, I probably would have killed myself. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't even locked in the house with the, those people, with that guy not being able to get out. Yeah. The worst thing I could ever imagine in a million years. And I thought this kid's doing this. There's kids yeah. that are stuck in their house with their parents. Yeah. It was terrifying to me many people it was yeah it, it was so, terrifying it, yeah. was, it was so so yep. weird you know it was uh completely uh you know not normal at all you know, it was no crazy. i don't think anybody came out of it the same <laughs> we right. all got stuck in a rubber room for like a year and a half but yeah. but yeah but i think that um that's why it's so important i think you know teachers or whoever anybody who sees it if there's some way that you can get to that child or get to somebody who can get them to open up um 
because they're no worse off at that point, you know. My although I will say that most of the kids, young kids, are going to say, "What if I have to go to foster care?" That's that's scary. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think most yeah. people. I would. I was better off where I was. I knew where I was. I knew the pattern. I knew how yeah. to live that life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's sometimes there just aren't any right answers. You said, you know, the fact that this is happening is just horrible. You cope with it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, it's also you know when kids are in a relationship, and I feel that. Young teenagers are, are just, they're just too young to be in a relationship to have, they don't have the maturity left, you know, yet to, to deal with relationships. And then when some kind of abuse happens, either physically or psychologically, oh, it's my fault. I must have done something wrong, you know, and, and that's just with their boyfriend or girlfriend. Imagine at the parent level. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it is, I think you, instinctually, it's you assume that it was you that did something. Who else are you going to, I mean, you could blame somebody else, but when you do that, that's usually an outburst and that doesn't go well. Right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. No, so Christina, you know, thank you um, so much for taking the time to uh, answer my students' questions. And we are going to watch this in class. And uh, I know they're going to find your answers uh, really valuable because, you know, in reading their questions, I know they're talking a little bit about themselves too. And there's yeah. some, you know, and <laughs> we, were all, we were all there. <laughs> we, you know, in one way or another, yeah. this is everybody's story. We've, we all go through yeah. something you know, yep. and we all find our, our, our ways of dealing with it. But I hope the students know one thing that no matter what happens, they are not alone. There are people around them every day to support them. And the schools, like you said, it's such it's such a place. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So Christina, we're going to close the curtain on this episode. But before we do that, you know, we usually end our episodes, you know, talking about you know, the KISS Army. Say something about KISS fans or whatever. But for tonight, you know, <laughs> for tonight, I'm, I'm going to ask you, what would you want to say, your final words to the young people out there? Wow. Um, I always, I, and I always say this, now, I speak up, um, but be humble. Mm-hmm. Be strong, mm-hmm. be humble, and be, it's okay to be yourself. You know, you don't have to fit in. Um, it's okay to be alone. You know, I, I don't know. I, I just say, just just be the best self you can be. You don't have to be somebody else. Yeah. You know, speaking uh, speaking of KISS, you know, I, um, we've often talked about this on this episode, on this uh, podcast, that, you know, KISS has afforded us so many opportunities for so many amazing experiences. And I believe that everybody should have a passion for something. It doesn't have to be KISS, but for something, because yep. it really enriches your life. Yes, it does. And it makes you happy. Yeah. Whatever, whatever that is, is is your happy place. You know. Absolutely. That's, it's important. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, just as 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 closing remarks, uh, Christina. Uh, just uh, again, let me uh, thank you for uh, for um, for your time and for sharing the story. Uh, you know, with us, uh, I'm really happy that that this was an episode that it was not uh, case related. Because um, I was much more interested to getting to know you, and uh, uh, you know, in uh, um, uh, I'm I'm being completely you know uh, honest here. I, it's a it's a blessing to getting to know you at least here through the camera, and I and I really hope uh, some someday we will have the chance to to meet you know face to face. But again, oh, thank, you. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, sharing your story and uh, for being positive and uh, for having such a wonderful life of, of purpose you know thank you so much oh, thank you guys for having me that was um that was enjoyable and thank you yeah and once again you know thanks again for for sharing your story with us and for answering my students questions and you know uh, claudio said this isn't kiss related you know kiss oftentimes is a springboard for other things mm-hmm. that's you know? right and and you know we talked a little bit about gene simmons and the and the uh, kiss mini golf but that's a good springboard to something that's really important mm-hmm. and yeah. especially your young people need to listen to this yeah. and this is definitely an episode uh for my students for the young people and it's something that needs to be heard and you know this book is a book that i believe needs to be read mm-hmm. thank you. it really does so thank again thank you so much for being on the show really really appreciate it Thanks, guys. (laughs) To the KISS Army, we hope you enjoyed and learned something from this episode. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please send them to talk to me at kissarmynationpodcast.com. Until the next time, remember, never stop rocking. Take care, everyone.
If you enjoyed this episode, like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on Spotify, Automatic, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to make yourself heard. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. See you all soon, Kiss Army.